Most Americans are well aware their country is in an opioid crisis. The opioid crisis is an emergency. The relapse rates after that are almost 100%. What most people don't know is that for opioid addicts, there's a widely agreed upon treatment option that could be saving many more lives, and many rehab facilities don't offer it. This week on Moving Upstream, we're looking at what that treatment solution is for opioid addiction and why so few facilities offer it. Whenever I get depressed, I go into a low peak where I won't talk, I'll sleep most of the time, and I'll just like hide myself. Like I'll go into my room and just not talk to anybody, go near anybody or anything like that. That's another thing of addiction, but we're not gonna worry about that today. We're on a bigger picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay? You know, you have all of it built up and stored in your body, and we're gonna begin to let that out. Let's start with Hannah Goldsberry, who lives in rural southern Colorado. A few months ago, she survived her fourth heroin overdose. If it wasn't for my friend finding me and calling 911, I probably wouldn't have woke up. Had your heart stopped? Yes. Your heart had stopped as well. Yeah, and they had oxygen on me and everything. That was my final and last. Wake up call? Yeah. After that wake-up call, her father called Dr. Barbara Troy. He knew she was the only doctor in their area within six Colorado counties authorized to administer what's referred to as medication-assisted treatment, or MAT. This is a group of drugs that help reduce opioid cravings. Dr. Troy put Goldsberry on a drug called Suboxone. It definitely helps all the cravings. You just recently got out of rehab. Like, from today, two months ago. Goldsberry is 23 years old. Before she came to Dr. Troy, she went to four rehab programs that didn't provide MAT. Each time she went home, she relapsed. Why do you think you relapsed? Because um, I'm really depressed and I was around the wrong people. She was honest and told me that she had relapsed. And then within a couple weeks later, that's when she had the accidental OD. Dr. Troy says Goldsberry's case is typical of what she sees. One, they're back into their old environment where they were using. They have nothing to help with the cravings, and the cravings will drive them to use. Dr. Sarah Wakeman is the director of the substance abuse program at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's in a growing chorus of experts who are trying to spread the message that rehab programs that don't offer medication are physically ineffective for opioid use disorder. So short-term rehab, going to a 14, 28-day residential rehab program, the relapse rates after that are almost 100%. So we're really setting people up to almost fail. Almost 100%? Oh, yes. Yeah. So you go away for 30 days and it's almost guaranteed that you're going to relapse. Yep, after your family may have spent $60,000 on said rehab program. Um, and so we're really setting people up to fail and then we blame them when they don't do well. Best practices for treating opioid abuse disorder, according to experts, also includes counseling and monitoring by a physician. Dr. Troy needs to meet frequently with patients like Goldsberry Urine is checked on each visit to assure compliance. Test one, she's negative for everything except buprenorphine, which is Suboxone, generic brand for Suboxone, negative for everything else. So we really got to give her congratulations on that. Before coming to Dr. Troy, Hannah Goldsberry tried to get into a methadone clinic. I tried getting into methadone and it was a three month wait. Three month wait. Could you wait three months? No. I would definitely go back and use, like, straight up. <laughs> why, would they, why did they say it was three months before you could get in? Because there's so many people trying to get on it here in the Valley. 
That gets us to the question, why isn't MAT easier for people like Hannah to access? Why aren't more Dr. Troy's available? One reason, the medications are highly regulated by the DEA. Doctors prescribe three medications to treat opioid addiction. The first is naltrexone. It blocks the brain's opioid receptors. The other two are methadone and buprenorphine. They're themselves opioids. They prevent painful withdrawal symptoms and suppress drug cravings. Methadone must be dispensed in clinics. Only authorized physicians can prescribe buprenorphine. Some treatment clinics refuse to dispense buprenorphine and methadone. That's because there's a black market for those drugs. They can be ground up and used to get high. So doctors have to jump through some hoops to prescribe them, like getting additional training and approval from the DEA. Fewer than 40,000 US doctors are authorized to administer Suboxone. Compare that to the more than 900,000 able to write prescriptions for painkillers such as Oxycontin, Percocet, and Vicodin. Yeah, actually, we live an hour away from here. We were lucky that we were able to get in with her, so. Another reason why medications aren't offered at most inpatient rehab programs, the idea that they are just replacing one drug with another. We visited one such facility in Huntington, West Virginia, Recovery Point. So they're going through withdrawal symptoms and they're doing it cold turkey. They are for opioids, um, cold turkey. We tell people coming in, yeah, it's gonna take you about a year to get through here, um, but what's a year for the rest of your life? Matt Boggs is the executive director of Recovery Point. Uh, recovery boys. <laughs> <laughs> go through the first part of our program. So people in recovery are uniquely qualified to help individuals, other individuals enter recovery and then sustain their own personal recovery. But we don't provide any medically assisted treatment. Um, we believe there's a therapeutic value um, in one person who's further in the program coming to talk to the other person who might be experiencing withdrawal symptoms. Every week, sometimes twice a week, they're gonna move beds. So it's just positive reinforcement. So. As they progress through the program, they get better placement, but they also get to see that as they change, they're moving forward. Bugs believes that the pain of withdrawal endured in a supportive community like his center is key to safely staying sober down the line. So here's what I really want to ask you. We've been talking to some of the top medical professionals in the country. Do you know what they're telling us? Medicaid assisted treatment. Yeah. Uh, is the best practice. That's what they're telling us. They're wrong? I don't think they're wrong. I think that we have to have a multitude of pathways. Do we want the, 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 our population, um, the, the millions of people who are in active substance use, to be on the medication uh, the rest of their life? I don't know. Some of the top experts are saying that there isn't a rest of your life for a lot of people who aren't getting MAT. I think it's important for um, people entering recovery sometimes to remember where it came from. It's been over five and a half years uh, since I've done any mood or mind altering substance. Heroin was my drug of choice. I didn't go through medically assisted treatment. It's not to say that it can't work, but for me, that wasn't my pathway. Bog says that more than half of his program's graduates have stayed sober. And the other 50%? The other 50%, um, a lot of them have relapsed. Um, some of them are incarcerated. Unfortunately, some of them have died. Isn't that reason to rethink what you're doing here? I think there's always um, opportunities that we need to look at what we're doing and see if there's any way that we can do it better. Back in Colorado, Dr. Troy, overwhelmed with requests for help, prioritizes pregnant mothers. She also delivers their babies. About three years ago, I had a car accident and I broke some bones and my daughter passed away. And I started taking oxycodone. Were you using more than you were supposed to? Um, there were times, yes. I was abusing it. You're abusing it. Yes. And how are you getting extra medication? Mm, like a 
everybody else, baby. Go away. There you go. Why are you crying right now? I could have lost him, you know. I could have. You know, I've, I've dealt with the drugs before, you know. I've seen it, seen it on the streets. A, a person should never have to be like that. Will mothers literally be taking heroin a day or two before they give birth? Oh, they can even do it the day they give birth. That's usually what kicks them into labor, is a hit of heroin. If you weren't here, what would have happened to Stephanie, for example? The baby would have gone into withdrawal, and then we put them on uh, medication of morphine and begin to wean them off. The baby's nice and stable. Baby did not have to be treated with any medications, and so they get to walk out of the hospital with their baby. Vargas's story speaks to the urgency of more and better help becoming available to opioid addicts. Do you turn people down? Yes, I do. Is that hard? Yes, it is. Why do you turn people down? Well, I, I can't do them all by myself. You, you can't be sustainable if you only have one person doing it. And still just you. Mm-hmm, yeah. After our interview with them, we got an update from Matt Boggs, who heads up the No Meds Treatment Center in West Virginia that we visited. Boggs wanted us to know that Recovery Point has established a committee to look at its retention rates and to consider whether they should use Vivitrol, that's an opioid blocker, as a tool. Thanks for watching this episode of Moving Upstream. I'm Jason Bellini. Hope you'll check out more of our episodes and share with us your comments.